The sign next to the double doors we enter says, I see you. Trina backs into my father's hospital room, pulling the wheelchair, and then turns me to face the bed. My dad looks like a statue. I reach for his hand and touch it with one finger. He doesn't move. The only reason I know he's still alive is because the machines he's hooked up to are making quiet noises. I did this to him. Is he going to be all right? I whisper. The doctors don't know, my mother says. Tears are running down my face now. Daddy, it's me, Kara. Wake up, you have to wake up. I'm thinking about all those stories you always hear on the news, the miraculous ones, where people who were never supposed to be able to walk get out of bed and start sprinting, where fathers with brain injuries suddenly open their eyes and smile and forgive you. I hear the sound of water running, and a door opens. A younger version of my dad walks out. He looks at my mother, and then at me. Kara, he says, wow. You're awake? What is he doing here? I called him, my mother says. Kara, just... I shake my head. I was wrong. I can't do this. Immediately, Trina wheels the chair around. That's all right, she says. It's hard to see someone you love in that condition. You'll come back when you're feeling stronger. I pretend to agree. But it isn't just facing my father, unconscious, in a hospital bed that has made the floor drop out of my world. It is seeing my brother, who's been dead to me for years. I sit down in the chair my mother vacates and drag it closer to the bed. Look, if you want to hate me, fine. But Dad doesn't have all the time in the world. We need to focus on him. The doctors are saying that his injuries aren't the kind that can heal. They don't know him, Kara says. They're doctors, Kara. You don't know him either. What if he never wakes up? I interrupt. Then what? I can tell from the way her face pales that she has not let herself go there mentally, that she hasn't even let that hint of doubt creep into her head, for fear it will take root like the fireweed that grows along the road in summertime, rampant as cancer. What are you talking about? She whispers. Kara, he can't stay hooked up to life support forever. You can't tell me that Dad would want machines breathing for him, that he'd want to live with somebody having to bathe him and change his diaper, that he wouldn't miss working with his wolves. He's a fighter. He won't give up. She shakes her head. I can't believe we're even talking about this. I can't believe you think you have the right to tell me what Dad would or wouldn't want. I'm being realistic, that's all. I reply. Choices? She says, choking on the word. I know all about hard choices. I've made hard choices, and I picked Dad. So how dare you tell me I'm supposed to just give him up now? I know you love him. I know you don't want to lose him. Before you left, you told Mom you wanted to kill him, Kara snaps. So I guess now you have your chance. I can't blame my mother for telling her that. It's true. If you want to make it up to me, Kara says, then tell the hospital I should be in charge of what happens to Dad. You're not old enough. They won't listen to you. She stares at me. But you could, she says. 